Hey everyone, today we are going to talk about the KEF Reference 1 meta versus the KEF R3 meta. And I'm also going to sprinkle in just a little bit of the KEF R3 versus the KEF R3 meta. Now, when I reviewed the KEF R3 meta last month or two months ago, one common thing that people were asking about is what's the difference between the original R3 and the R3 meta and should I upgrade? And I will briefly reiterate what I said in that video. And if you want to go watch a little bit more detail, you can do that. But to sum it up, the R3 and the R3 meta have essentially the same directivity indices. So the early reflections directivity and the sound power directivity indices. But they don't have the same frequency response. And that means that if you are not using equalization, then the R3 meta at least in my opinion, beats the R3, hands down, because the R3 meta has more linear response, especially in the room. If you go and look at the estimated in-room response, then you'll see what I mean. And it's also worth noting, and I said this in that previous video, that one reason why I didn't do any kind of direct overlays between the data set of my R3 and the R3 meta was because when I ran the R3 testing, it was the first or second test that I had performed on the Clipple near field scanner. And the settings that I had, I can't remember if I had smoothing enabled or if it was a number of measurement points that were fewer, but essentially the data that I have for the R3, the original one, is more, is the word I'm looking for, coarse or fine? Basically, it was just more smooth. So when you looked at the R3 meta, you thought, oh, wow, this thing is a lot worse. Well, that's because there was no smoothing and you caught all the little resonances, all the little diffraction effects that the R3 data, at least of mine, did not show at that time. When I requested to test the R3 meta, I actually had asked someone at KEF if they would be willing to loan me the original R3 so I could retest it and they just didn't have any more. So I was never able to retest it in the same conditions that I've been testing stuff since probably my second or third Clipple near field scanner speaker test. So I wanted to put that out there. And again, just to reiterate, the R3 versus the R3 meta without equalization, big difference, R3 meta wins out hands down. If you have equalization and you're able to align it to the same points that you need to the R3, I'm not saying it will sound the exact same, but I'm saying it's pretty dang close and use prices for the R3 or somewhere, it depends on where you look, but let's just say around a thousand bucks per pair to twelve hundred bucks per pair used. If you have equalization, something like a mini DSP, then the R3 non meta probably is the better value. Well, it's not probably, it is the better value. But if you're not using equalization, then the R3 meta, hands down, no doubt in my mind, the better speaker. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about the R3 meta versus the reference one meta. The R3 meta retails for about 2,200 bucks per pair. The reference one meta retails about $9,000 per pair. It's a huge, huge price difference. Up front, I like both of them. The reference one meta speakers, one of my favorite speakers that I've ever heard. And it is one that I would truthfully consider buying. I've had a lot of requests for me to create this video because people want to know, is it worth what, like four times the price, essentially, to get the Reference One Meta. And actually, one of my patrons asked me that question directly last week. And my answer to him was, if you have the money and you really want what I consider the best of the best bookshelf, at least certainly by Kef, then the Reference One Meta, get it, buy it. If you don't have the money and you're really scraping by and you're thinking, am I missing out a whole whole, whole lot by not getting the reference one meta and instead getting the R3 meta, then I will say maybe not a whole, whole lot. And then one area that the reference one meta really shines, for me at least, is in terms of dynamic range. And we're going to see some of that in the data in a little bit. The reference one meta just has better drivers and it can take power more, uh, I don't want to use the word efficiently, but it can take it better. And so you have better dynamic range. The reference one meta also is smoother in response. So we're going to see some of that in the data. I'll go ahead and say up front that if you have any questions, let me kind of go through some of these. And if you don't mind holding the questions until toward the end, 
that would be appreciated because I may miss some. Also, if you want to do super chats, that would be much appreciated. And this system highlights super chats automatically. So those are easier for me to find. So if you want to do that, that would be great too. I'll go ahead and kick things off right now and say that um, the driver technology on the Reference One Meta is better. And you can go and look at the pictures that I'm going to show you in a minute. You can go look in more detail at your own leisure. But one thing that stands out about the Reference One Meta, at least visually to me, driver-wise, is if you go and look, the Reference One Meta has a bunch of little ribs all over the cone. And presumably that's done to make the cone maybe more stout, basically just to kind of break up modal issues. Uh, whereas the R3 Meta doesn't feature that. Now the Reference One Meta, I believe, has a neodymium magnet, whereas the R3 Meta has a ferrite magnet. Now, I'm not an engineer that designs drive units. I've tested hundreds of them at this point, raw drive units. And my opinion of it is, is that I don't know that there's an inherent benefit between ferrite and neo other than space savings. And you can get a smaller neo magnet and do as much power as a larger ferrite magnet will do. And if someone here happens to be a speaker designer or engineer that designs drive units, please leave a comment below and let me know what the inherent benefits are between the two other than size and weight. Cabinet design for the Reference One Meta, hands down, it is a much more resolute design and it does feature an aluminum, a pretty thick aluminum front baffle. And I believe that that baffle, if not the whole speaker, maybe it's just the baffle is built in England. Don't quote me on that. I'm just kind of trying to recall from memory there. But I will say certainly that the Reference One Meta is a more stout speaker and it is not going to have any kind of resonances or anything like that, that lower tier products have. Now, that's not to say that the R3 Meta has those resonances and I'll kind of keep an eye out for that when we go through the data because frankly, I've not looked at that in a comparative sense. Um, they both feature the Meta technology, which is, for lack of better words, kind of what I would consider like a Helmholtz, Helmholtz resonator on the back. And, and what it does is it traps the back wave and then it dissipates it in an organic sense rather than having the back wave come out and then right back into the cone of the tweeter. I do wonder why that's not implemented for the mid-range and rather right now it's just implemented for tweeters. So maybe somebody from KEF can answer that in the comments below as well if they have any input on that. The reference is the flagship model. So it, it has the upper status and that's where a lot of trickle down technology comes from. So the reference one meta was introduced in 2022. I reviewed it pretty early on. I think it was around May of 2022. And it took about a year or so for the R model to come out with their own meta design. And that's kind of the upfront things I think were worth pointing out. I mean, build quality, again, goes toward the reference one meta and the R3, a great looking speaker, but just doesn't have that same build quality. And let's see if I can go ahead and just throw you guys a couple of photos up of this. So this is the R3 meta and this is the Indigo Blue. I believe this is the only speaker that features this colorway, at least in the R series. And then this is the Reference One Meta. And as I said earlier about the multiple ribs on the cone of the mid-range, so that's kind of cool. As a size comparison, just looking at the front, so you can get a, a rough idea of how much larger the Reference One Meta is compared to the R3. And I'll say that the Reference One Meta, when I was handling it, moving it around, certainly felt more inert, more sturdy, more resilient than the R3. Again, it's not to take away from the R3 meta, but it's just that the Reference One meta bookshelf speaker is a tank in a good way. An overview, price prepared, 2,200 bucks for the R3 meta, 9,000 bucks for the Reference One meta. Sensitivity on the Reference One meta is about three dB lower, which means you are gonna need more amplifier power. Uh, F3, F10 on the Kef R3 meta is, well, a little bit higher than the Reference One Meta. The Reference One Meta gets lower in frequency for sure. And you definitely notice that additional bass. Impedance on the two, they're kind of in the same ballpark. The Reference One Meta, again, is going to be maybe a little bit harder to drive. So both speakers, I would advise, probably you're going to need a four ohm 
nominal or four ohm capable amplifier, separate amplifier, I wouldn't suggest trying to power this off an AVR. And the linearity is similar on axis between the two units. So let's go ahead and start looking at more data. And here's the obligatory Clipple near field scanner photograph. And I'll throw up a little video because I just love And in doing so, I am able to take the speaker or the room out of the, out of the speaker equation. I'm able to just look at the speaker and say, all right, what's this speaker doing on its own? And a lot of people wonder, well, why does it matter? I'm going to put the speaker in the room. Well, science engineering shows us, and through a lot of trial and error over my last like 10 to 15 years of doing this, I've learned that below, in most rooms, below about three to 500 hertz, the room really dominates the sound. So that statement that, why do I care what measurements look like? Well, that's semi-true for the low bass. You're going to want to use equalization or bass traps, room treatment, stuff like that to kind of smooth out the room modes. But above that frequency, which is the Schroeder frequency, if you want to Google that, S-H-R-O-E-D-E-R frequency, means that the speaker is really going to be the dominant source. So all the reflections and things like that going on, they're less impactful on the speaker than or in regards to what you're going to hear. So you're going to hear what the speaker is doing, and we're able to predict what the speaker will do in terms of its estimated interim response. And we'll see that data in a little bit. Let's go ahead and dive in back to show on stream. All righty. So this is the KEF R3 Meta Impedance. And as we can see here, I've noted that it has a minimum impedance of about 3.2 ohm above 80 hertz. The reason I say above 80 hertz is because a lot of bookshelf speakers and things of that nature, if you really care about the impedance, then you're going to have a separate amplifier. But most people using bookshelves, they probably think, ah, I don't care. So I'm going to cross it to a subwoofer. And that's the logic for me putting in above 80 hertz. You can look below it and see what you find. But above 80 hertz, 3.2 ohm, minimum EPDR. So essentially kind of like the, how do I put this? Um, the effective resistance of the speaker when you account for the phase is going to be about 1.9 above 80 hertz. So, and that's going to be this point right here. And that really just kind of goes again to tell me that you're going to want an amplifier to drive this speaker and not use it with an AVR. Forum amplifier would be my suggestion. Now, if we go to the reference one meta, the scale has changed, right? That's not something I can easily fix myself. On the left, it's 15 on the R3 meta. On the reference meta, it's 20. So just keep that in mind if you're flipping back and forth between this information. Uh, the EPDR and the minimum impedance are reasonably close to the same in regards to what kind of amplifier power you're going to need, or I should say what kind of amplifier you're going to need. So four ohm stable amplifier is again suggested. This is the on axis response, but I wanted to point out that in these measurements, what I found was that, and, and Kef even suggests this, 10 degrees off axis for the R3 meta is the best aiming position for this particular speaker. On axis for most coincident coaxial drivers, usually is not the best aiming because there's some diffraction effects from the tweeter housing into the mid range, and the mid range is the waveguide. So you do have some diffraction effects, and therefore they explain to you that you should generally tow the speaker in or out by about 10 degrees. And that's what I've done here. I've shown this measurement. And you can see that the linearity of the speaker looks really good. Average sensitivity again is around 86 decibels. F377, F1037, so the same notes that I hit on earlier apply here, but this is just a graphical representation. And look how smooth this is. This is almost one and a half, plus or minus one and a half dB through the mean. And that's pretty freaking incredible for a $2,200 speaker. But now we go to the reference one meta, and you can see the main thing that stands out, well, two main things, but one thing that's gonna jump out to most people is gonna be the extended base. So let me go back up, R3 meta, reference one meta, R3 meta, reference one meta. Look at the base extension on the reference one meta. Now this is with the port in long mode. Now, there is a short port version that you can use for the reference one meta. And if you wanna do that, then that will change the tuning frequency of the speaker. But for the sake of all of this information, it's gonna be long port mode because that's what worked best in my opinion. And again, oh, sorry. You can see that the response is about plus or minus one and a half throughout, it's incredible. But I wanted to point out that there is somewhat of a decreasing 
sloped response. And just, I mean, very, very mild. But if you go back and compare it to the R3 meta, you can see that the R3 meta is flat most, most of the higher frequency. And then there's this peaking going on around eight kilohertz or so. Whereas the reference one meta is reasonably flat, but somewhat decreasing in amplitude. And I mean, just barely. And that's going to be important later. The reference one meta, 82.5 dB, you're going to need a stronger amplifier. So if you were trying to get these two speakers to the same level on just power alone, you're going to need to double the power because that's 3 dB different. So you're going to need to double the power. If you had 100 watts for the R3 meta, you're going to need 200 watts for the reference one meta. Do I think you need that much power? It depends on how close you are to the speaker and how much volume trying to fill and how low you expect the speaker to go. If you're going to use a crossover, then, you know, maybe not. You may not need that much power. And if you are not going to use a crossover like with a subwoofer or something like that, then you may actually be able to use a little bit less power and just keep it in check. So it just depends on kind of your mindset about that. This is the Kef R3 meta at 10 degrees, the CEA 2034 data. And I wanted to point out, look at the ERDI. It was pretty darn good. Now, remember I said the ERDI between the Kef R3 meta and the Kef R3 are pretty much the same. And I did overlay them. I just haven't provided it here again because the resolution of the measurements is not the same. And I don't want anybody taking the wrong, excuse me, the wrong conclusion there. So we can see that the R3 meta looks just wonderful. And if we go to the R1 meta with a long port, another speaker that just looks really dang good. And I wanted to note there's, there's some more resonances here in the mid-range area of the R3 meta. Now this 250 Hertz, I really wanna point this out. This is a room anomaly right now with my current setup. I've got some issue I realized it about three or four weeks ago and I am working to resolve it. So at some point, what I'll do is I'll try to go back and fix some of these curves to show that that's not really the speaker, that's the room, and um, or at least it's my setup right now, and I'm working to resolve that. But yeah, the reference one meta looks really good. Okay, so estimated in-room response. I'm gonna show the zero degrees and the 10 degrees for the R3 meta, and that's what we've got here. Zero degrees is in red, 10 degrees off axis, so towed out slightly, is in black. Now, if I show a trend line through here, you can see that if you want the more neutral response, then you wanna tow the speaker out by about 10 degrees. Now you can go further than that. I don't have the data here to show you what 30 degrees looks like, but if for some reason you put these in your room and you thought, yeah, these just are a little bit too bright for me, just turn them off axis a little bit more, either cross them or face them out more away into the room, depending on what it is that you're trying to go for in terms of sound stage with radiation. Now we'll look at the reference one meta looks really dang good. I don't have zero and 10 because I think, let me see here real fast. Yeah, this is zero degrees right here. So yeah, at zero degrees on axis, it also looks really good. It, with this speaker, you could tow it off a little bit maybe to knock this upper end down, but I don't see that as an issue. I mean, that's not even one dB. I, I don't really see that as an issue. This little bit of a dip right through this region, this one kilohertz area, uh, could sound a little bit laid back. I know I've used that term before and I use that kind of freely when I talk anywhere between one to three kilohertz because it's going to take a little bit of bite out of certain instruments, especially brass instruments and things of that nature. Snares to me have a little bit more bite around 600 to 800. So you're not really going to have that issue there. And if I go back up to the R3 meta, you'll see that it also has some similarity in that region as well. So tonally, they may sound kind of close to the same, but the reference one meta is more smooth in response and it has extended bass, which I really liked. Okay, so the radiation width. The reference or the R3 meta is at about plus or minus 40 to 50 degrees, depending on where you're looking. So at lower frequencies, it's more omnidirectional. And as you go toward higher frequencies, it becomes to be, it begins, I should say, to narrow in frequency or narrow in radiation. And then if I go to the reference one, so this is what I found. The reference one to me does look like it's a little bit wider. And I actually pinged one of the guys at Kef and they said it shouldn't be wider because, and I believe that they told me that the, the cone profile is basically the same. Now I may have misread that or maybe misremembering, but I believe that's what I was told. And I was like, huh, because when I look at it, it just looks to me like the R3 meta is more narrow. And I seem to recall feeling like the reference one meta here had a little bit more of a broader soundstage, and I loved that. And 
if my memory is correct, this combined with the linearity and combined with the base extension are reasons enough for me to say the reference one meta is easily the better speaker. But is it four times the better speaker? I can't make that decision. That's going to have to be something that I would encourage before you spend that kind of money to go and listen to these or maybe even work out something with a dealer where they'll let you take both home and make the decision. Vertical orientation. Really good feature about coaxial coincident designs is that they have wider vertical orientation where you can kind of go above and below the tweeter axis or the reference plane and have neutral sound, similar sound that you do within a range of about, what is this, 30 degrees? So plus or minus 30 degrees, pretty darn good. Most two-way speakers don't really have that, and that's a good feature of a coaxial design. The Reference One Meta is closer to about plus or minus 40 degrees, and in some instances, plus or minus 50 degrees. So it does seem, again, to have a little bit more wide, taller, or longer radiation than the R3 Meta, and I find that curious. So let's flip over to the distortion. 96 decibels at one meter. Here we go. Looks good until about 80 hertz or so. You're below 3%, so can't really complain. It's a bookshelf speaker. And then if we go and look at the R1 meta, it's similar as well. And I'm looking back and forth. The one thing that I'm seeing on the R1 meta is that in this upper frequency, in the mid-upper frequency, uh, the reference one meta has lower distortion. So that's that's kind of cool to see. And there's more separation in the third order distortion, which is a if you if you really care about distortion and you think harmonic distortion really really matters, then lower odd order distortion is a good thing to have. Okay, now this is the area where the reference one meta just pulls right out of the head of the R three meta, and that's in the compression testing. And what I want to see is a flat line because that indicates that as I raise the volume from seventy six dB to 86 decibels in red to 96 decibels to 102 decibels. If all three of those colors are flat right here, that means that the response of the speaker hasn't changed and that means it has high dynamic range. It's able to go from 76 decibels, because I say right here, reference to 76 decibels, to 102 decibels, so that's 26 decibels of dynamic range without issue, if those lines are flat, but they're not. And what we see is some sort of loss of control at the highest output volume for the R3 meta, which indicates to me then that it doesn't quite have as much dynamic range as the reference one meta, which we're about to see. But also usually these are indications of that woofer is just, it's not keeping up with the output and it's probably exceeding excursion or there's some port chuffing or something along those lines. In the case of me listening to this, yeah, the woofer was just exceeding excursion capability. And even though 102 decibels is extremely high. Check this out. Look at how much different the Reference 1 meta is. The Reference 1 meta really takes the cake in terms of dynamic range. And that's really where its bread and butter is in regards to just output capability. So let's see here. Do I have anything else? No, that's it. Um, yeah, I mean, it really didn't take me. It was surprisingly short, actually. <laughs> So let me just kind of wrap this up then real fast, and then I'll check out some of the comments, see if you guys have any questions. As I said earlier, R3 versus R3 meta, similar if you use EQ. If you don't have EQ, R3 meta wins out. I discussed that in my other video. You can check that out more in detail if you check that video out. R3 meta to R or reference one meta. With the price difference alone, you would hope that the reference one meta is going to be a better speaker. And it is. It's certainly objectively and Subjectively, to my ears, the Reference One Meta is an incredible speaker, and I have schemed of different ways to try to get that in my own home, along with various other speakers. But is it worth four times the cost? And that's just something that I can't tell you. If you come to me and you say, I've got 3000 bucks, but I can't do a thing more than that, I'm going to say, well, then get the R3 Meta. I mean, you, you can't afford the Reference One Meta, so don't sweat it. You're not like, you're not missing out incredibly, if there's just no way you could swing the reference one meta. But if you are able to, if you have the kind of money where you're looking at the reference one meta and you're thinking, yeah, I can afford that. That's not really a concern, but I don't want to buy a product that isn't really a whole lot better than one that's, you know, a quarter of the cost. 
my honest assessment is the reference one meta is a better speaker. If you can afford it, get the reference one meta. Done. Both speakers could probably benefit from a subwoofer. The R3 meta definitely can in terms of dynamic range. So if you're listening at long distances or you want to have a lot of dynamic range swing out of that speaker, then get a subwoofer for the R3 meta and you'll be happy. You don't necessarily have to have a subwoofer with the reference one meta unless you're trying to get really low. And I would say comfortably into the 40, 30, 40 hertz, 20, 30, 40 hertz region. And then in that case, you're still going to need a subwoofer. It is a large bookshelf, but it's only got one six and a half inch woofer. It's not going to get down to 20 hertz like maybe some bigger speakers would. So with that said, um, if you don't mind, if you haven't already, please like, subscribe, do all that stuff, because that really helps YouTube algorithm. If you are interested in supporting what I do in any facet, you can use affiliate links. I'll drop some of those in the description below. I don't have any for the reference one meta. You've got to go to a dealer to purchase that speaker. But if you're interested in the R3 meta to try out, I have some affiliate links below. Patreon is another way, you know, just those kind of things help me to afford shipping and to be able to buy speakers and try them out and then, you know, sell them at a little bit of a loss to patrons or friends or locally and things like that. So that definitely is appreciated as well. So let me go check out the chat and I'll blow through some of this and see if I've uh, got any questions from any of you all. Okay. Julio, 499 Super Chat. Thank you, Julio. Would a Morant Cinema 50 be a good pairing for the meta? Uh, the Morant Cinema 50, you know what? I don't know, so let me go and see what kind of power it's got. Okay, give me a second. I'll just show you what I'm doing here as I'm doing it. Morantz Cinema 50. Okay, Crutchfield's got it. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a big old boy. Non-channel amplifier and eight ohms. So do they say, if it can't handle a four ohm load, if they don't explicitly say that, then I don't know that I can say that it will, that it would be a good way to power it. I mean, the power wise, I think is okay, but I'm not seeing anything about that being able to handle a four ohm load. What I would do, what I would suggest is to take my impedance data, go to my website, copy and paste it into an email, send it to Morant, say, I want to buy these speakers that have this load, will your AVR work with that? And just ask them. And that's that's one one way that you can use my data. Aaron, you like to talk about toe in or out to get off axis, but what about putting the speaker on shorter stands? So that's vertical. And you can do that with these speakers, but you can't do that with all speakers. And yeah, that's it. Let's see here. Uh, I'm just looking through here. Okay. Oh, let's see. Okay. My brother runs a reference one meta off a of cinema 50. It works, but the speaker could definitely use an external amp. Yeah. With a reference one for sure at, at 83 decibels sensitivity, you're going to need some, some power for that. If you're trying to listen to them at appreciable levels, especially since it's a non-channel amplifier, or AVR, at least according to the spec that I just saw. So if you're going to be loading this thing down, I'd be, be really careful. It says 110 watts with two channels driven. I mean, with having enough power on tap, again, that's going to depend on how far you sit away. So personally, if it's me, I'm looking for an amplifier that's probably 150 to 200 watts, and I'm just kind of naming that off the top for the reference one meta. For the R3 meta, I think 100 watts would, would probably be sufficient for most people unless you're really concerned about having a lot of dynamic range because your music has peaks of, they'd say, over 10 decibels of dynamic range, and you're sitting maybe more than like three meters away. And I've actually got a video on how to buy the right amplifier based on power. It's a couple years old. If you want to go check that out, you can do that. Okay. Is Kef R3 Meta $800 better than Kef R3, which is selling for $1,300 brand new? So that's what I touched on the beginning of this video. And if you use equalization, then you can do a lot to make the R3 very similar to the R3 Meta. Uh, if their price difference is only $800, uh, 
then consider that you are going to have to use a DSP because most AVRs aren't going to have the kind of equalization that I would think you would need. So I'm talking like mini DSP of some sort. That's about 200 bucks or more, depending on which version you get. And then you're running it active basically at that point. So you're going to need an external amplifier. And I'm when I say active, I'm not talking like three-way or two-way active. I'm just saying the, the speaker has its own dedicated amplifier outside of a AVR. So that dedicated amplifier is going to cost you a little bit more money. And by the time it's all said and done, it might be just easier to get the R3 meta. You know, you may not wind up saving a whole lot of money and you got stuff. You just got more stuff. Uh, if you're talking about $1,000 or more, then yeah, maybe get the R3. But I can't tell you for certain. I know some people want that certainty, but there's variability. I mean, there's different price ranges. There's other things that you may want. You know, you may want an excuse to go buy a new amplifier that has more power, or you may want an excuse to go buy a mini DSP or some other sort of equalization that allows you to fine tune things to your own desire. And in which case, get the R3. But if you don't care about any of that stuff or you just don't want to bother, get the R3 meta. And the other thing about the R3 meta is it'll hold its value a little bit better when the next thing comes along and you try to sell it. So that's my opinion on it. Um, let's see if I've got any super chats in here that I may have missed. I don't think so. And if not, I'm going to go ahead and bail out because I've got a tinge unit on my back right now and I don't want to be standing any longer than I necessarily need to. All righty. So that does it for this review. I appreciate you all watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Again, if you're new to this channel and you appreciate this kind of stuff, hit me with a like so I know and please consider subscribing and I will talk to you all later. Have a good night.